Champaign County Agriculture Today with your host, Dennis Riggs. Hello and welcome to Champaign County Agriculture Today. My name is Dennis Riggs, your host for the next few minutes as we discuss issues of importance to you as a consumer of agricultural products. Whoa, you're a consumer of agricultural products? Are you sure? Well, heck, you go to the grocery store to buy your food. No, as we all know, food comes from the farm. We think about crops that are grown here in East Central Illinois. Uh, we think about farmers markets that we go out to. But another very important part of the food cycle and the, and the food that we consume, of course, is the animal side of agriculture, the meats that we consume. Very important for our health and well-being. And we don't get a chance to hear the basics about what it's all about, what's good for us, where do those meats actually come from. That's why today in our program we've got some great experts here that will uh, bring you all up to date. So if you, if you like a T-bone steak, if you like a pork chop, uh, sit back, relax, and you're going to know a lot more about those items after our program today. Today in our program, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Carr from the University of Illinois. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting and, us, Dennis. Oh, well, it's, it's great to have you. And Dallas Duncan from the University of Illinois. Uh, are you actually a student over there as well or past that? I graduated last year, and now I've been a full-time laboratory technician for a year. And then in August, I'll be starting vet school at the University of Illinois. I bet you and your parents are glad to, uh, to have that the graduation passed. All right. Well, definitely the first one. <laughs> Dallas, give me some background uh, as far as where you're from. Uh, what brought you into the whole field of, of animal agriculture? Well, I grew up in Fowler, Illinois, which is from the western part of the state. Um, I grew up on a diversified livestock and grain production farm. I was always very involved in 4-H and FFA. And then when I came to the University of Illinois as an undergrad, I majored in animal sciences and then started uh, meat judging with Dr. Carr here and then followed up with the livestock judging team as well. So uh, let's say that you not only have the production side of agriculture, but I would assume that because of the meats background in animal agriculture, um, you can identify a pretty good T-bone steak. Is that right? Well, I hope so. <laughs> What's your favorite cut of meat? Um, I like ribeyes. Ribeyes are my favorite. I got to go with you right there. <laughs> Dr. Carr, let's get a little background here. You've been at the U of I for a little bit of time, is it that? Tell us about yep. that and also your background. Okay. Well, I'm actually a native of Kansas. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, was raised on a cattle ranch in south central part of the of the state. I uh, got my bachelor's master's degrees at Kansas State, my PhD at Oklahoma State University. And then uh, in August of 1974, came to the U of I as an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Sciences, and, uh, with really the majority of my appointment being uh, uh, a meats extension specialist for the state, uh, as well as half-time teaching in the Department of Animal Sciences here at the U of I. And, We'll be starting my 36th year in August. So you know where all the light switches are over there at the U of I. Well, at least at the meat science lab. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, let's talk about the U of I. And, and a lot of times we think of Illinois as a crops um, state. We don't think about the agriculture side. How important is animal agriculture to the state of Illinois? Well, it's extremely important. Uh, you know, there's only a certain amount of the crops that we consume uh, and so you need another as, as humans, and so you know the animal side of that is is critically important in the consumption, uh, obviously of corn and beans, and then uh, that is converted. Uh, we hope to a high quality protein uh, of meat that we consume, and so the animal side is very very important, and uh, we we keep uh, hoping that that uh, you know uh, the, the feeding sector of beef cattle would move back in this area because you're close to the source obviously of the of corn and, and beans. Uh, I think we're still currently number four in the in the country as far as pork production is concerned and so obviously uh, the the uh, raising and then the the feeding of livestock is critically important to agriculture in the state. Let's go backwards several years back to the more basic agriculture where you had the typical family farm had uh, had the crops out the growing in the field. You had the barn. You had some chickens, and you had some hogs, and you have your cattle. Will we ever go back to that? Should we go back to that? And why have we changed? I, I really don't think that we'll probably go back to that. Uh, obviously, we've seen a tremendous reduction just in the number of farms in the state in, across the U.S., but in, in the state of Illinois. And back in the old, the old days when we did. Uh, uh, have almost every species, uh, you know, raise them. Uh, you had a, a, 
many times a large family at home and you processed those animals, uh, had your own meats, maybe even smoked your own meats at home and have a little smokehouse and that type of thing. And, and those days are just history. Everybody's moved from the farm to the, the, the city, not everybody, but the majority have. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've seen, uh, you know, the farms get larger and larger and larger, uh, more focused in production, maybe one, two or three crops uh, without animals. And uh, it just seems to be the way it's gone. You know, uh, e the efficiency of production has, has driven us that way. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, to remain viable and profitable, uh, you know, a majority of agriculture has been forced to get larger and more efficient to survive. I'm going to ask Dallas for some statewide perspective here. You coming from the background of the western side of Illinois, and, and we're, of course, over here on the east central side of Illinois. Is there a difference as you cross across the state, maybe from your home area over around Quincy? I definitely feel as though there is, because when I came to the University of Illinois, I was shocked by the, the low numbers of livestock. Where I'm at, it's not as flat and it's not as farmable, and we have a lot more cattle and hogs, a lot of cattle over where I'm at. And I could be wrong, I don't have the numbers, but I, I definitely was surprised when I first embarked on the University of Illinois in Champaign County, and it seemed like there was a lot less livestock. Well, and of course, a lot of that, I think you hit the nail on the head there, the land, the type of land that is over in western Illinois, more of the natural streams, more of the hills that are not suitable yeah. for row crop farming. And we have timber soil, so it's, you know, not the, the wonderful black dirt. We do have a lot of good dirt, too. I don't want to say that we don't. There's a lot of very profitable farmers over there, but we get to... Uh, a lot of trees and, and sometimes rock ridges and it's just a little bit different landscape, very different topography. Which makes great pasture. Perfect pasture for cattle. So. Okay, well that's uh, a lot of times as I travel around the state we see that difference between uh, the topography and of course farmers in their hopes of becoming more and more efficient uh, use the land to its highest and best use. Yes. In in the flatland areas of East Central Illinois, it's pretty good for growing those crops, which can also provide the feed for the animal livestock in maybe Western Illinois. So yeah, I was, I was wanting to get the background there. I, I wasn't sure. Tell us about your work that you do at the university as a lab technician in the meats area. What is your daily functions over there? What type of things do you like to get involved with? Well, it rotates a little bit. I do some projects on meat quality and meat tenderness. So to kind of see that we're uh, supplying consumers with a very palatable product, you know, tender meat that juicy and you know that tastes good that everyone likes. Mm -hmm. um, do some research projects on different muscle profiles and the amount of protein that's in muscle and uh, just kind of things like that. Seeing how much extractable fat might be in a sample of meat mm -hmm. and just uh, I think that that's about that's about the main part. Of it. Well, let's get let's start at the basics. We're, we're going to go to visual. We have some visuals we're going to share with the folks today. And we're going to go to slide number four, and this is where it all begins. We're going to talk about animal agriculture, and of course, uh, slide number four is going to show us just exactly what we're talking about. We have two animals here. Should we let Dallas answer this question? Dallas, what what are these? Let's go to the top top left hand corner and bottom right hand. Tell us what these two animals are. Well, on the top left hand corner, we have a beef bull actually, and there on the uh, right bottom we have a hog. <laughs> so we're talking cows and hogs. Cows and hogs. That's the main <laughs> thing there. Uh, now we have a bull there. That's not necessarily what we think of as far as hamburger or or, or is it? Um, well, a lot of uh, cool bulls or bulls, once they have mm -hmm. you know bred cows and done their service, then yes, they will probably be ground hamburger. But as far as the steaks or higher quality cuts that you get, usually come from steers or heifers that go into feedlots and are fed for 12 to 15 months. Mm -hmm. Bulls are usually four to five to six years old when they're harvested, so they go into hamburgers so you don't get a tough steak. <laughs> but we're talking beef. Uh, that's our that's our product comes from the top left-hand corner. Yes. Bottom right-hand corner, pork. pork. What kind of products are we talking there? You know, your hams, your sausage, your uh, very valuable, popular bacon, um, hot dogs. A lot of pork goes into hot dogs, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Why are, I don't know who wants to enter this, why are cattle, and, are they the main meat producers? Dr. Carr, maybe you can answer that one. Is, is cattle and hogs the best, most efficient way that farmers can bring animal protein to the consumer? Well, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, consumption, uh, we consume a little bit more beef on a, a per capita consumption base than we do poultry, chicken, and then pork comes in third as far as uh, the type of animal that we're talking about here, you know. Diversification, we sell a tremendous amount of beef in the fresh state, more so than we do pork. Seventy percent of the pork that we actually uh, merchandise 
is for the processed. Could be, as Dallas has already mentioned, it could be bacon, sausages, uh, bratwurst, wieners, that type of thing. Most of the pork that we merchandise in a, in a, in a fresh part, you know, comes from the loin area, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about here in a little bit. Cool. But uh, uh, so uh, the majority of beef is sold in a fresh state. Uh, steaks, roasts, ground beef, uh, those particular types of cuts. Well, let's let's try to get into this. I think that's what most people are going to wonder. When you go to the meat counter at the grocery store, you're wondering, okay, you know, where's this all coming from? So we're going to go to slide number one. This is a visual we have for number one. And it's going to take those, uh, those same animals and it's going to turn it into kind of what is coming from these animals. Uh, Dallas, I'll let you go back to that. Again, top left-hand corner, we're back to the steer again. Uh, what, what types of things are outlined in that visual? Well, those are the different cuts, like you have the rib and the loin and, and all of those different brackets or areas show you what cuts come from each part on the animal. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, from your rib, you get your ribeye or your strip steaks and that type of thing. From your loin, you get your short loin and your sirloin steaks and that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Now, bottom right-hand corner, we have the hog there. And then that's pretty much the same scenario again. There you, you know, you see the box that says the ham, and then you have the loin, t the loin chops down the top, and that's where you get, you know, your uh, your pork loins and that kind of thing and then you have the ribs and everybody loves to go get their barbecue ribs oh, and, yeah. and that uh -huh. kind of a thing so that just kind of outlines you know how the animals harvested into different sections to give you different cuts of meat okay dr carr you go to the meat counter at your favorite grocery store and you see all those fine wholesome fresh uh meats are out there that can make that barbecue grill really perform um who do we have to thank? Is that the because the university has done such a great job of, of teaching how to how to grow the animals, or is it the meat cutters, or is it a combo deal? It would be a combo deal. You know, we've done a lot in the last 20, 25 years to uh, remove uh, a lot of the fat on the outside of the cuts. If you compared beef uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, in the retail case, there would be probably at least a half inch of fat. On the outside now obviously you can say well we can remove that with a knife that's true but there's also been a lot of fat removed through genetics by improving genetics made the cattle more efficient in their production of conversion of, uh, uh, of feed uh, to muscle uh, we've seen uh, and then uh, because consumers have asked for uh, leaner meat uh, what external fat might have been on the subprimals or the retail cuts, uh, the meat processors have removed that external fat. And so, you know, as you walk in and see this retail case, it's all red. Now, on the flip side of that, you hope that there are some fat in the muscle, which of course is called marbling or intramuscular fat. And that lends some juiciness and flavor to the meat as we prepare it for consumption. Let's back up to a basic premise I'd like to establish with our, our folks who are listening today. We have people that uh, most everybody enjoys a cut of meat as far as their, their consumption. We have those that don't like that. Why is meat in our diet an important thing? Well, meat provides some very important nutrients as far as, as our human health is concerned. It's an excellent source of, of protein. And that protein can be broken down quite easily by the body. Uh, and, and then, you know, it's an excellent source of, of uh, minerals and vitamins, minerals such as iron, uh, magnesium, phosphorus, uh, those types of, uh, of minerals. Vitamins, a uh, very excellent source of water-soluble vitamins like uh, the B vitamins, B1, B2, riboflavin, uh, niacin, uh, vitamin B12. Uh, so. There's some, a lot of positive things that uh, we can get from the consumption of, of, of organ meats of, uh, as well as, as animal meats and uh, uh, that are very nutritious for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, obviously there are also some problems. We have to be concerned about the number of calories you might ingest from meat as well as cholesterol, which is, comes from any type of an animal product that we have. If you have to avoid cholesterol, you're going to be on a plant diet. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about another issue we hear in the news every once in a while, and that's organic versus non-organic. First of all, just maybe a quick definition of what would make a meat an organic meat, and then what's, uh, what's the benefits or, or problems we have in that area? Well, organic would be any meat that has been produced from an animal 
that uh, has not been fed any growth promotants, uh, antibiotics, uh, those types of, of, of uh, uh, substances that, that are used to promote and increase efficiency in, in our meat production today. So it would be meat that has uh, just uh, come from an animal that has not received any kind of uh, uh, device or ingredient that promotes. Does that include the daily feed of the animal? No, no. As long as that, that, that corn and those beans, and this can be carried uh, a long ways. Uh, you know, did this come from corn and beans that maybe was not fertilized in a certain way? Uh, everything's all natural. You know, did it come from grass? Uh, the animal come, you know, from uh, was raised in a, in a, a pasture that uh, was grass and hadn't been treated in a certain way or the grass hadn't been fertilized, uh, you know, and then as it fed, did it come from grain uh, that uh, was all natural, you know, and, and so forth. If the animal happened to be get sick and had to be treated, then it would no longer be qualified for, uh, you know, being that organic label as such. What a dilemma is we all know farmers are trying to grow the most basic and wholesome food uh, that they possibly can, but all of a sudden if you cannot um, provide antibiotics to make a sick animal well again uh, because you're striving for the organic, uh, what does that do to the farmer? Well, it creates a huge challenge for him. You know, if, if he has a, 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 a niche market for organic beef, uh, he's got to make the decision, all right, do I treat this animal or not? Well, if the animal is going to die, he's probably going to treat it, mm -hmm. you know, from that standpoint. No longer is it viable for the, that, 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 that label, that product, you know, from that standpoint. Because of that and because of the decreased efficiency in the way the animal grows, being organic, uh, it costs more money. Uh, it's not nearly as efficient as far as this production is concerned, rate of gain, those types of things. And so obviously if a consumer wants the natural product, they're going to pay considerably more for it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the, and some people are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And some people think that the, the, the meat is more healthy and, and more nutritious mm -hmm. uh, than what we get in, in normally in our, our retail stores and that type of thing. I personally disagree with that. But that's <laughs> well, I'm going to turn to Dallas and ask her that same question. I'm sure as you have talked to, uh, to people, and of course part of the younger generation, is there a demand for that? What do you see from your experience as far as the organic versus the, uh, the, the, the conventional, Convention. more of the conventional meat production? Is there a demand for that? And if so, what are the benefits and, uh, and pitfalls of that? I definitely think there's demand for the conventional, and, and I come from a conventional farm. I'm not, I do not have organic livestock, and we have a large cow-calf cattle operation, and we also feed cattle. So obviously I think that the conventional system works and there is demand. I also think there is somewhat of a demand for the organics. There are a lot of people, especially that I went to college with my age, that are dead set on organic, organic foods. I personally am not. I think there's a lot of definitions that go into what's organic or all natural, as Dr. Carr said, and I think it sometimes gets wishy-washy and maybe you have to look on the, on the individual label to see exactly what that company or processor's definition of organic or all natural may be. But you've probably seen agriculture adapt, and I know I, I've seen grocery stores that here's the section for that type of product, and then here's the other section. Exactly. Are, you, are you seeing that as well? Yes, actually, very much so. Okay. Yeah. Now, bless the American farmer, him or her, uh, are adapting as well, and they're trying to fill those niche markets with the, the product. Uh, so that's that's a good thing for the farmer, I suppose. Uh, there's, there's lots of farmers out there that see that niche market where they can make several dollars more per pound per mm -hmm. head of beef, and that's a very profitable option for them so they'll raise the organic to try to generate more dollars mm -hmm. in that type of a manner okay all right well, let's let's back up we, uh, we kind of got off the subject a little bit not really but a little bit we want to get back to our consumer that's sitting there today and you're saying but I want a ribeye and where, where, where should I be concerned about that so we're going to go to slide number two uh, our slide number two is going to give just a little bit of a, of a background on when you go to the meat counter and you see these different cuts of meat uh, here we go this is a this is a little bit more of, a, of an exploded diagram dr. Carr I know uh, you get to explain these all the time so I'm going to put the put the ball in your court there what have, what have we got there okay well you can see in, in the in the uh, the top half of the animal is where the really high dollar 
retail cuts come from. And that's a, you know, if you're looking at the, the, the rib and, and the loin of an animal, it's an area of support for the animal. Whereas if you take cuts that come from the chuck or the round, the legs are areas of locomotion. It has more connective tissue. The areas of support have less connective tissue. Therefore, that's where those high dollar, supposedly tender steaks will come from. And the ribeye, obviously, is one of those examples of, of, of uh, a very desirable steak as far as beef is concerned. Of course, and that's when you go to your local restaurant, and if you order a hamburger, it's $5.25, and you order uh, some ribs, it's uh, $12.25. That's exactly right. You, cool. you pay for what you, you know, you get what you pay for. That's <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. It always works out of that. Let's go to slide number three. Uh, our slide number three then is going to take us over to the pork side of the aisle, and that's going to talk about the different cuts there. And once again, there's some similarities, yet it's a different animal, right? Right, and it is very, uh, very similar. The top half again of the animal is where your, your, the fresh portion of this pig, uh, is going to be uh, fabricated into chops. Uh, a few roasts, and uh, you know, uh, uh, then the rest of that pig is going to be further processed. And, and as you look at the ham, yes, you can get some fresh ham, and it's delicious. Uh, fresh ham roast is excellent, whether it's boneless or bone in, but most of the time it's sold and cured in, in smoked form. Mm -hmm. uh, that bacon or belly there, I mean, that's where our bacon comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, you might get spare ribs out of there, out of that fresh side, and Barbecued spare ribs are pretty good eating. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a few roasts out of out of the Boston butt that are fresh, but uh, again, the, the majority of that pig is going to be sold in a processed form. Let's talk about that process of getting the animal from the farm to the grocery store meat counter. What are the responsibilities of the following people? A, the farmer. B the meat cutter, and then finally the consumer in purchasing those products. What's the farmer have to do to make a good quality meat? Well, really, it, it starts with the genetics of the animal and trying to select animals that are going to produce, uh, you know, a, a very uh, heavy muscled animal with, with not a lot of waste and fat. Uh, and then uh, as he transports that to the processor, uh, hopefully he handles the animal appropriately enough that won't cause some quality problems like a dark cutter or a PSE. We won't get into that, but uh, anyway, you can influence the quality of the meat by the way that animal's handled even before it gets to the processing plant. Do all the genetics and the feeding correctly, and you can still mess it up. Uh, and then as far as the process is concerned, you know, he has to uh, harvest that animal in a very sanitary fashion. Uh, uh, meat inspection is critically important to the industry. And, and we want to put before the consumer a very uh, wholesome product. And so he's very much involved in that aspect of it. Let's talk about that inspection process just a little bit. That is a function of the government. Uh, meat inspectors uh, do their thing. Is that paid for by the consumer, by the farmer, by the processor? Who pays that person? Well, meat inspection, both federal and state, is basically paid through our taxes, federal taxes as well as state taxes. Okay. So that, that's a part of uh, being a citizen of the United States and uh, of Illinois. And that's why we have good quality meats. We see all the time uh, foreign uh, pictures of, from Mexico or, or other countries where uh, the way the meats are handled, displayed, and, uh, and processed may have a little bit of a question to it. Uh, we have a pretty good system here in the U.S.? It's excellent. Excellent inspection system. And, and most of us will say it's, it's the best in, in the world mm -hmm. as far as uh, it's the wholesomeness and, and guaranteeing safety for our consumers. Let's talk about one thing that's kind of going away. I know here in East Central Illinois, Champaign County specifically, there's only a couple of meat processors you can go to that that's all they do. Most consumers go to a grocery store to pick up their, their meats from, mm -hmm. that, from that counter. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a, a processor that that's all they do, you can't buy your bread and your milk and your cornflakes there, uh, and the grocery store as far as how they handle their meats? Well. Being a, a small meat processor is a very challenging job and, and uh, j just because you don't have the volume of animals uh, going through that a, a, a Tyson's or a Cargill has, uh, you know, they've got to eke every little bit of profit out of there that possibly can. So they're going to specialize uh, uh, 
in, in, in they may have a little niche market. They may specialize in a particular type of, of, of product or sausage they have. Custom harvesting of animals, uh, farmers bringing in animals to be to be harvested and processed for the family. That has, you know, that's not a very large portion of most of our process because we don't have, as Dallas said, we don't have very many animals in Champaign County. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, they do a lot of catering, a lot of for the processing, of barbecuing, maybe making a specialized sausage that they, uh, they promote, uh, you know, that they hang their hat on. Uh, as far as uh, a, a small meat processor is concerned, their their you know customer service is going to be a big thing to them. People come in and say, well, "I'd like to have this. I'll prepare that for you. I'll mm -hmm. cut that for you," which you may not be able to get at, at uh, Jerry's IGA, mm -hmm. uh, and, a chain type of store. Right. Right. So so they once again, specialize. niche marketing. We've talked about niche marketing and the organic versus non-organic. Dallas, I've got I've just got a couple minutes left on our program, so I've got to get this question. It's been burning me. I don't know. <laughs> You are the first to ask it. Does Canadian bacon really come from Canada? I don't know that I have a definitive <laughs> answer, but I believe no. There is some popular stories or myths that uh, during the Second World War, the United States government decided to give all of the soldiers a slice of bacon to increase their morale and decrease desertion. So, because bacon from Canada and bacon from Europe has an extra muscle, it's not just the street bacon we have in America, all of the soldiers decided to call it Canadian bacon. All they knew was it was different than bacon from home, and it was from Canada. If you ask a Canadian about Canadian bacon, they won't know what it is. Maybe a totally different answer, too. <laughs> Correct. So does that mean German pot roast doesn't really come from German cows? I would say it's probably true. Okay, well, you know, it's, it's kind of like the old adage, just chocolate milk come from brown cows and white milk come from Holsteins. There's always a story. Okay, well, I'm glad we got that myth taken care of. I wasn't sure. Um, where's the future of, of animal agriculture? In just the minute or so we've got left, uh, is it strong? Is it is a good thing for our consumers to have good animal protein in just a few seconds here? Very definitely. Uh, per capita consumption in the United States uh, continues to go up. Uh, and, and so we know that uh, our American citizenry are eating a lot of, of, of high quality meat. Uh, it'll drop this year because of the economy, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're consuming a tremendous, we're trading our steaks and roasts in for ground beef. We're consuming a tremendous amount of ground product because it's cheaper. And, but no, I think it, uh, it's very strong in the United States and, and our export market continues to be an important part of that also. Very good. Well, it's good to know that our American agricultural animal agriculture subject is very strong. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today, and we hope everybody goes out and enjoys that ribeye. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And we appreciate you watching today. We hope you'll tune in again next time. We will continue our exploration of animal agriculture and production agriculture on Champaign County Agriculture Today. I'm Dennis Riggs, your host. Thanks for watching. Champaign County Agriculture Today is brought to you by Champaign County Farm Bureau.